Good afternoon. How is everyone? Did everyone have a good lunch? Good. So I apologize. I'm a little croaky today. So bear with me as I try to find my voice. So I know we're just coming out of lunch. We're going to try and keep it a little bit interactive today. So welcome to my session, GitHub and Azure Better Together. I am April Edwards. I'm a senior developer advocate at GitHub. I've been at GitHub for a whole seven months now. Prior to joining GitHub, I was at Microsoft for over five years. And in those five years, I got to write this content for Microsoft Build and deliver it globally. So now I get to deliver it for you all here. Uh, how many of you are using Azure today? How many of you are using AWS or GCP? OK, good. I like to see a good mix. We're not just all about Azure. We're going to talk about some of the other clouds as well. We like to be inclusive of all the clouds. So um, yeah, I've been in tech for 24 years. This is my second time here in Portugal, and I love coming back. Um, and when I started off my career, I started off in the operational space. And I started working in Azure actually in 2013. And if anyone remembers Azure, it was called Windows Azure, or Azure, depending on which uh, intonation you want. And we rebranded it to Microsoft Azure because it wasn't just about Windows. And over 60% of the VMs in, uh, in the cloud in Azure are actually Linux VMs. So Windows Azure did not fit as a title. So um, yeah, I, in my career, I've moved around. I've done different things. And in the last few years, I've been more in development. Probably in the last 10 years, I've gone into development. Um, I got tired of designing data centers and lifting and shifting. I got more into refactoring and doing a little bit more with that. So that was kind of where my path went. So we're going to talk about GitHub, and we're going to talk about Azure and how they integrate. And there's always questions about the different product stacks. Um, and we're going to take a good look at it, at it all. So before we get started, I want to ask all of you a little bit of interaction. After lunch, how would you define DevOps? You can just shout it out. We're all friends. The flow from development to all the stages. Yes, so the whole process of, de of development. Yes, anyone else? Someone, come on. I'd offer free swag for an answer, but I'm out of swag. Um, <laughs> But with all of us here, we all have a very different definition of DevOps. We have different backgrounds, we have different technical skill sets, we come from different places in our life. So I want to go ahead and level set. And this is from one of my great colleagues, Donovan Brown, who's now retired from Microsoft and racing cars, must be nice. Um, he defined DevOps as the union of people, process, and products or technologies to deliver continuous value to our end users. Now, I want to work, focus on this word value, because all the things we're going to talk about today is the technology, the process, but what value are you actually delivering? We think about the DevOps process. Um, we have all this tooling, we have all these products and everything we're doing, how do they interact? But it's the people change, it's our interaction, the developer experience, it's the operational teams. So when I was in operations, I was tasked with keeping the lights on 24 by 7 by 365. I had to maintain a certain nine of uptime in all my infrastructure. And then when I moved into development, I was tasked with pushing features. And those things collide all the time. So if our teams aren't aligned to delivering the same value and the same end goal, we're not going to be able to align our process and our products to that as well. And we can invest all the money in the products. We've all done it, right? We've worked for an organization, and they're like, here's all this money. Buy this new tool. It's going to fix all the things, and we're going to do all the DevOps. But that's not actually how it works. We've got to change the fundamental people side of it. So why DevOps, right? And we talk about all the tooling and everything else. The world is a very, very messy place out there. Um, I've worked for organizations. We've bought all the tools. We've done all the things. It's going to make our lives better. But the reality is when we plan, we build, and we go through that process, there are so many different tools we're asked to use. It's hard to context switch. It's hard to know what tool to use. Maybe we like one tool better than the other. And we have various skill sets amongst our teams. And that's really hard to be a very agile organization. So what we've done at GitHub, and we've done it at Microsoft as well, is we've built a platform that lets you to build, scale, and deliver secure software from beginning to end. Now, who remembers GitHub in the days of old in 2008, 2007? A few of you, all right. So in 2007, we were a small startup at GitHub. You know, we just had a little bit of a code base and a little bit of a platform using Git to push all of our changes. Now we've grown into this end-to-end -end platform. So we're going to talk about that end-to-end -end product, what all the products do, and how we can deliver that better as organizations. What we want to do is improve that developer experience for you as the developer. Now we use this word developer a lot. So I'm going to go ahead and throw out a really controversial statement. Everyone is a developer. If you tell a computer to do something for you, you're a developer. So when I worked in operations one day and I said, I'm a developer, I got things thrown at me. I've said it out on Twitter to one of my operational friends, and I got like exploded on on Twitter. 
but that same person was using things like PowerShell and Bash to do things and to automate stuff. You're a developer. You might not be a programmer. You might not deliver websites and applications, but you're a developer. So we are going to use the word developer a lot. It is inclusive of everyone sitting here in this room. And I have someone sitting over there who does not work in tech, per se, but she's a developer as well. She just doesn't know it yet. So we want to be able to lower that maintenance and that overhead that we have with all that tooling. Now, the really cool thing is you can integrate all these tools into GitHub, and probably a lot of you are doing that today, because we're a huge open source platform. There's some really good stats out there on open source contribution. Um, over 90% of organizations are using open source today. How many of you use an open source product in your day to day? A good portion of you. Um, and that's maintained on GitHub. A lot of that is maintained on GitHub. And I'm going to just you know, kind of say it. Microsoft acquired GitHub to get closer to the developer experience. So that's why we're at today. That's why we have the GitHub and Azure story. And that's actually why I moved from Microsoft to GitHub, was to bring that story together and to deliver that from the GitHub side, because we're making such huge investment in that space. So why do we care about DevOps? Because your competition's already doing it. Now, the really cool thing in DevOps is we talk about theories, we talk about all these commonalities, but we have actual hard statistics to prove that DevOps, DevOps works. We can measure things. We can measure time to deploy, time to remediate. All these important things change when we, when we look at our organizations and how we're delivering our software and our applications and our infrastructure to the cloud. So we're going to have an outage. And I hope we don't have an outage while I'm here on stage, but it's happened to me. GitHub's had an outage. How do we recover from that? How are we transparent to other organizations about that? In a high-performing DevOps organization, we know that they can recover from incidences much, much faster, over 2,000 times faster. We also know we have faster time from commit to deploy, and that's why it's important to be a high-performing organization. How many of you have deployed, still deploy software once every six months? I see a few hands. It's okay. Safe space. Safe space. Um, I was talking to someone recently at a, at a conference, and they're like, our customers do not like us deploying stuff regularly. They only like it every six months. And I'm like, do they not like your feature updates every six months, or do they not like how you break everything six months? And they're like, yeah, they don't like how we break everything. Right. So how do we revert that? How do we come from that? How do we have more frequent code deployments, high-performing DevOps organizations? We use this term called shifting left in DevOps. We want to fail fast, and we want to pretty much do things more often, smaller chunks. Instead of pushing big monolithic applications where we might update them a few times a year, we want to do things and push things to production. Now, if any of you worked in an organization where you've done these big monolithic pushes, I used to work in an org that was like this many, many years ago, uh, we take an entire like bank holiday weekend and we get ready. We'd have a whole team ready. We'd have our development team, our operational team, our security team. Everyone was on board. It was all hands on deck. We'd push our updates to our infrastructure and our features in our applications. And everything would break. It was a non-repeatable thing. It happened all the time. It cost us time, money, and a lot of gray hair. Um, so what happened? Um, we started changing how we did that. We started doing more, more frequent deployments. I deploy into production every single day. How many of you deploy into production every single day? A few of you, good. It's a hard thing to do, but you know, I work with a lot of organizations that do deploy into production every day, several times a day. At Microsoft and GitHub, we deploy into production several hundred times a day. If I pull up the GitHub repository, you can see the actions running. You can see all the code getting deployed live as we are kind of doing this. So why is it important to shift left? Because it costs our organizations less. And at the end of the day, they want to see this result. They want to see how we're outperforming our competition. And we know that when we deploy these things to Azure and we catch it in production, it costs us a lot more money. This is a problem. I have done this before. I've taken out an entire infrastructure. Um, I'm, st I, I, I'm still employed after that, but we've all been there, right? We've taken out an entire infrastructure. Um, but then there's other organizations that have been a little bit more exposed. I haven't just made an oopsies, but some organizations actually put passwords in production. How many of you put a password in production? Really, no one's put a password in production? OK, I got two. I've done it. Um, not recently, but it was probably like 10 years ago. So how do we do things early and often? So the things we're going to talk about today are going to get closer to the developer experience. How do we help ourselves as developers deploy more frequently, but also prevent errors? So what does a normal day look like for you and I? Realistically, I don't write a lot of code. I'm in meetings. I'm waiting on other people. I'm waiting for access to things. I need to be able to deploy code faster. So that small, minute amount of time I have every day needs to be more effective. And that's why we're shifting left and doing things earlier and often. The other good thing is, if we fail fast, we know it doesn't work quickly. Instead of it failing, and it goes on for months, 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 and months, and there's a big cost and expense to the organization. But in our day in the life of a developer, we need to be more effective in how we do things. So what does secure software development look like? Now, 
I am not a security expert, but every project I've ever been on, I've had that security person say, you can't deploy to the cloud, it's not secure enough. When the cloud came about, and I was really, started getting really involved in deployments in 2013, it was always the security person in the room saying, this isn't secure enough, we need to do it a different way, we need to look at how we do it. As a developer, I don't care about security. I mean, I don't want to do stupid things, I don't want to cause a security breach, but security isn't my forte, it's not my specialty. So how do we enable our developers to be more secure and write secure code? So this is where GitHub and Azure and Microsoft have paired together to embed this in our developer workflow. We want to be able to stay in the flow, we want to be more secure and not push those things to the cloud. And more importantly, we talk about the people side. How do we bridge the gap between our development teams, our security teams, and our operational teams? So they've put together a really good graphic here of what this looks like in the Microsoft GitHub ecosystem. So while everyone says we're the same company, we're absolutely not. We're very different entities, but we do work together. And I think that's an important part of the story. So it starts with where you, clone your, where you write your code in. How many of you use VS Code or Visual Studio every day? Does anyone here use Notepad++? All right, we're going to have a chat. <laughs> so true story. I was with a customer, and we're, we're working on the project. We're writing infrastructure as code, which is one of my favorite things to do. Don't judge me. Uh, we're writing infrastructure as code, and this, this really, really awesome, smart human who's wicked great at writing code had just learned Terraform, is coding away, and goes, April, I need your help. And I'm like, sure, what's going on? He goes, I have an issue in my code. It took him four hours, and he couldn't figure it out. And so I took his, took his branch, looked at his code, pulled up in VS Code. He was using Notepad++, and I found it in about 30 seconds. Why? because I've got the extension of VS Code to tell me where the heck the code went wrong. So we're going to use VS Code. Actually, we're going to use Code Spaces. We're going to cheat, but it's going to be similar. I'm going to use this development experience to push some code up into the cloud and see what that looks like as us, the developer. Now, where do you keep your code? How many of you keep your code in a local server in your environment? OK. Do you have your own Git system? Azure DevOps Server. OK, so you're self-hosted, but you're using a third-party product. OK, that, that's allowed. So where are you keeping your code? <laughs> That's a, that's a secure place, sorry. That's a very secure place, I love it. Um, and I'm a big fan of Azure DevOps. I used to work with a product group, so I, I love the product through and through. So where's your code? Now we say GitHub repo, and again, it could be in a self-hosted server, in an Azure DevOps server, or a GitHub enterprise server hosted in your data center, because that's very common. Not everyone can just poof, move to the cloud, right? So then how are you deploying those things? With Azure DevOps server, using Azure pipelines. Yes, they're using Azure Pipelines, fantastic. So we're gonna talk about GitHub Actions today. So you can integrate Azure Pipelines and GitHub Actions. Um, they seamlessly go across each other. Um, I'm not going to demo it today because I'm not gonna pull up Azure DevOps, but I can show you how to do that and we can talk about that. Next up is security. So when we're writing our code before we deploy it, we wanna look at things like our advanced security package, like are we scanning our code? So Uber, one of, our favorite, uh, one of my favorite examples for who likes doing code breaches like all the time, they don't scan their code. Their code is sitting in GitHub. Um, I don't know why they're not using our products. Not, it's, they're not really my customer. But we have code scan enabled to find those passwords in our code. And why does Uber keep having a breach? Because they're not scanning their codes. They're not being proactive. They're not bringing those tool, tools to us. Um, the other thing we have in GitHub Advanced Security is dependency scanning. Again, open source consumers out there, what packages are you using? How do you keep track of all those packages? I can't. I absolutely can't. And again, I'm not a security specialist. So we're going to look at GitHub Advanced Security and actually how that interacts with our code and helps us to solve those problems a little bit better before we deploy it. Again, that developer experience. Um, and then how we push things to the cloud. So I've containerized all my applications. Um, I'm quite fortunate. Not all of us can do that. But we're going to push that into Azure Container Registry and scan our container in that action to see how it goes and then deploy it into Azure. So our security teams and our SecOps teams care about things like authentication. They want to look at Azure Monitor. How do we hook those things into the process? And then how do we do things like things as code? So when I started off in tech, everything was CLI, no GUI, no pointy clicky things, click ops was not a thing. As I progressed in my career, GUIs came about. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I can see what I'm doing. There's pretty pictures. Love it. We're going back to everything as code. We deploy things through, this has ARM templates. I prefer Bicep um, or Terraform. But then we can add in our policies into our infrastructure as code. When we can deploy that, put those policies into our pipelines. And then we have things like securing our code, whether we use Azure Key Vault or GitHub Secrets. We can use any of those. And again, hooking in the Azure security experience to that experience, bringing that security team in. And we can hook all these products into what you're deploying in GitHub with GitHub. So where does security fit in the development lifestyle? The life cycle, not lifestyle, sorry. Uh, security starts when your developers clone their code. So we have to think about how we secure our machines. So that the same person that I was speaking about before that was using Notepad++ had an extremely, extremely locked down machine. Why? They didn't trust their developers. We're always given 
the crappiest laptops, we're given the basement offices, we're given like the cobwebs and all the junk. We're getting the throwaways, but they want to secure and lock us down. And when we secure and lock down our developers, we prevent them from being more creative. Being innate, we disable them from being who they are and to be able to write code. Again, think about that pie chart I showed up where we're waiting for access. How long does it take, how many people when you're getting started a project takes a day to get access to everything? Two days, a week, a month. When I was in engineering, I had a lot of customers. It took us two to four weeks to get access. We kick off a customer project. We do a whole architecture thing and a month to get access, two weeks, et cetera. It was always that spin-up time that we were waiting on. But then we had to think about how we secured our machines, and that was a whole other conversation on top of getting access to the infrastructure and everything else we needed to do things. So if we're thinking about where security starts, we want to think about the pre-commit. Where, where are we writing our code in? The IDE. We're going to talk about that IDE experience shortly. But we need to use secure coding standards. How many of you use peer review when you're pushing your pull requests? Awesome, quite a few of you. Um, anytime I push a pull request when I was more on the engineering side, we had one person from the Microsoft engineering team, one person from the customer. So everyone had visibility and we could cross-reference what was going on. Peer reviews and the human side is really critical. Now, there's a lot of talk around AI and automation. We're going we're to automate some things. The people side is absolutely critical. We still need peer reviews. You need to understand the code, what's going on. So we need those standards in place. So AI is not going to re replace all of it. While there are features coming out in GitHub uh, very shortly in a few weeks to help with peer reviews and pull requests, it doesn't replace the human element of reviewing this. So I just want you to remember that. It's a co-pilot because it is our friend. It codes with us. It doesn't code for us, technically. So then when we commit that code, what are we doing when we commit that code? Are we doing unit testing? How many of you love writing unit tests? How many of you have 100% code coverage? I like asking this question. Oh, we got one. I get like one person every talk now. I love that. Like usually there's like no hands. I love seeing someone getting 100% code coverage. I don't have it. So I envy you. We can, we can hang out later and talk about how you do that. Um, so how do we commit our code, right? Are we doing dependency scanning? Are we doing tests? Are we doing any tests? Are we doing tests before we deploy to production? Are we protecting our production environment? So we're going to look at how we do that. Then we deploy our code. Are we using things like infrastructure as code? How many of you deploy things by the portal by hand? All right, I see a couple of you. OK, no judging. Friends here, remember, safe space. That's OK. But when we look at infrastructure's code, we can test it. When I worked in infrastructure, we just pushed the big red button and deployed stuff. And we were like, what's going to come out on the other side? So when we deploy those things, can we test it? Can we see it? We can do security acceptance tests before we deploy it to production. And one of the biggest pieces of the puzzles operate and monitor. I was working with a customer in the UK uh, a couple years ago, and they're like, we're doing all the DevOps. They were really excited. They were like, we're super agile. We're doing all the things. Um, but we're missing something. And I'm like, OK, so talk me through your process. What are you doing? They weren't doing any monitoring. Monitoring is key, because when I showed you guys those stats of how effective a high-performing, agile organization is, that's coming from our monitoring. How fast are we recovering? How fast are we deploying? How can we do better? You need to measure everything in this cycle so that when you go to your next sprint cycle, you can do better. And that's what we're looking to do. We need to measure to, measure to improve, not measure to, to hinder our developers. So we have GitHub Enterprise. Um, for those of you that have used uh, Azure DevOps, um, similar-ish kind of product, but very, very different all at the same time. So we have things like collaboration, inner sourcing. You know, we, we talked about open source, right? Consuming open source products. We're taking those practices in-house and using practices like that to develop inner source practices. How do we plan our projects? Okay, planning is critical because before we can execute, we need to plan and plan well. We need to be able to put things in, uh, secure our packages, contain those packages in a container registry. How do we automate and develop? We're going to talk about GitHub Actions and code spaces. And again, everything is code. And then we need to have everything secure by design. So every product we de develop within Microsoft and GitHub is secure from day zero. Now, there might be some features missing, but the security is there. Security comes first when we're developing these products. So we're going to talk about GitHub code spaces. So I'm not going to talk at you for the entire hour, because nobody needs to hear that. We're going to do some actual coding in a minute. GitHub code spaces I love. Um, I'm working on a PC right now. I have a Mac at home. I've got another, another device in my office. I can interchangeably work between all three devices in a secure environment. It spins up a containerized environment in Azure, and I can set the environment for every person in my organization. So instead of waiting days, weeks, months to get access to things, we can spin up a code space directly from our repository, which we're going to do shortly. Simplifies my workflow. I don't have to context switch. I don't have to come out of it. And we can customize them. So the same person that had Notepad++ running couldn't run a local test. Why could he not run a local test? Because he had like four gigs of RAM, and his machine would just fall over. And half the time, my machine falls over because it's a special feature that it has. I don't know why. But so we can scale those up. We can get more compute out of it. And we can customize that. 
And then when we talk about security, we have a secure development environment for our, our developers. We don't have to worry about what's on my machine. I don't have to worry about you know, when my screen timeout is or installing things. I can have that experience within the browser and be able to be mobile and move around the world. So Dependabot, we're going to talk about some security features because we need to be secure by design. When we go to do some things in a minute, we're going to look at the dependencies that are in our repository and what we can do to remediate them. So we want to integrate this with our developer workflow. Again, not a security expert, but I need to know that when I have dependencies in my code, when they're out of date, and is that providing a vulnerability or an open door for a hacker or someone to come in? We're going to look at code scanning. And I like using the password example because we've all done it. We've all put a password where we shouldn't have. Because when you put a password in GitHub, it lives for forever. You can get it removed, um, but you have to actually revert that password, and you have to get it scrubbed. And that's a bit of a pain. So we're going to look at code scanning. We're also going to look at a really cool feature called push protection. Uh, we're going to prevent ourselves from pushing that code up. And we're going to do some things with actions. How many of you automate things in your day-to-day? -day? Quite a few of you. Awesome. I love automation. I love automating all the things. Now, when you're using things like Azure DevOps, you have Azure Pipelines. And that is purely CI, CD, continuous integration, continuous deployment. Actions, you can literally automate anything. What's really cool about Actions is we do have them as a uh, hosted runner, so you can host them within your data center for security, but they're also cloud hosted. And they run on Windows, Linux, and Mac um, containerized environments. So you can literally test against any line of code, any bit of code. If you're developing for Apple and iOS, absolutely, you can test your apps on that. What's really cool about them is they are secure by design. We have more features coming out, but they integrate into our workflows, into what we're doing in our day to day. And when I say we can automate anything, I can literally join a repository and then have an action that runs that tells people how to do things. I have an actions workflow that we're going to look at in a minute that closes, that, excuse me, that destroys my Azure environment when I close a pull request. So as a good developer, I open up my pull request, I make some changes to my code, and when I do that, when I close that pull request, it runs an action and takes out my entire test environment. So I'm not running that extra cost in the cloud, which is really important. But we're also going to use it for some CI, CD, and deploy stuff. So let's get into it. So we have a repository here in GitHub. This is public for everyone to look at. Please don't break my demo while I'm doing it live. Thank you. So we have a repository, and we want to get started coding. Um, we have the big green code button, right? So for those of us that use VS Code, we normally click on the big green code button, and we'd replicate our code to our laptop, right? Yeah? But we also need to install packages. Does anyone know what packages we have to install, how long that takes, what versions we need? Right? We don't know. So getting started can be tough. And whenever I start a net new project, I always use a GitHub code space because these whole things take so much time out of our day to day. At Microsoft, they have something called the Open Hack Program. It's a three-day hackathon where you can learn things like containerization, security, um, data center migration, and getting started's hard. So when we were doing these hackathons, it would take people half a day just to get started. Right? We need to install things, all these dependencies. We have different machines. So instead of going through all that stuff, I'm going to click on the code spaces button here. And I'm just going to click a code space and create off my main environment. Now, we can fully customize this environment to how we want to do it. I'm just using some defaults with a few gigs of RAM. Now, if I start running local tests or doing anything, it will ask me to um, increase the size of it. So it is building our container. We're getting all of our code, and it's going to spin it up for us. So those of you that use VS Code, you're going to find this looks identical to VS Code because it is VS Code in the cloud. And I have all my settings synced across. So while this is loading, I want to show you all something cool. So we're in our repository. We're writing code, and again, getting that code down and making changes can take a while. If I just hit the period or full stop, this pulls up the github.dev site where you can edit your code now. Let's see if I broke it. I broke it. OK. So this is our exact repository that we just saw. Um, it's opening up all my code. I can edit it within the github.dev site. It's a little known hack. It's great. But it's not secure. 
So I use this if I have to maybe change some documentation, a markdown file, um, something really easy to do that I need to do on the fly. Uh, the problem with it, though, is I can get away with a lot of things. A lot of the GitHub Advanced Security doesn't apply to this. This is just run, running in a web browser. It's really lightweight. I cannot run and debug my code from here. Um, I can open, I can change branches and write some code and push my code up and create a pull request, but there are no protective barriers around this. So this is like the quick and dirty editor, but it's not secure. So while it's a cool, fun thing to do on the fly and show you all, we're not going to write code from there. So I'm in my code space here. I'm going to go ahead and make it a little bit bigger for us. Can everyone see that? Does anyone, do you, are you guys okay with the dark mode in the back? Yeses. Okay, cool. So we have our code here. Um, we can make some changes. We have everything we need. We have extensions that have lined up. Um, first thing we're going to do is we're going to change some code. Let's see what happens. So I talked about actions, and in my code base, I have a .github file. And in this .github file, I have a, deploy, uh, a deployment file that deploys to Azure. This deployment file is written in YAML. And in YAML, yet another markup language, I am telling it all the tasks I want it to do to deploy my code to Azure. Now, we haven't really gone through the code base yet. We haven't really looked at it. But we're going to walk through what this does really quickly and then see what the output looks like. So first thing I'm going to do with my code is every time I make a pull request, it's going to trigger this. It's going to build my image. I'm going to send it up to Azure. So you can see here at line 20, I log into Azure. Let me make this a little bit bigger for everyone in the back. So line 19 and 20, I log into Azure. And notice here I have secrets.credentials. I don't have passwords in my code. Look at that. I'm a good developer today. The next step up is we log into Azure Container Registry. Now, as we log into Container Registry, I've been a really good developer, and I've hidden my password. But we're going to put in a fake password here uh, and just call it this is my password, and everybody loves dollar signs. So I've made some changes to my code. We can see that on the left-hand side here, my source control recognizes it. And I'm going to go ahead and push my code up. Oh, you know what I didn't do? Thank you. Didn't stage my changes. Right, stage my changes. Now I can go ahead and run git push. OK. So what was supposed to happen is that when I pushed my password up, GitHub push protection would stop that. Now what I found in the last couple days is that uh, it doesn't work right away. So there's definitely a bug in, in GitHub push protection. Nothing is perfect. I'm going to try to run a few more times and see if it does it. It won't. OK. So that demo kind of failed. But in theory, it should have stopped us from pushing that password up. So how do I enable these things? How do I stop these things? I'm going to go into our repository again and look at the GitHub security settings. So if I go into my security plane, I have quite a few things uh, enabled. So I can look at vulnerability alerts. Let me pull up another environment for us as well that has more security vulnerability alerts. So I'm just going to show this other repository because it does have more vulnerabilities for us than the existing one. So in theory, what we should have seen is that I pushed up a secret, and it should have stopped us. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't break my own demo today. But it tells us it has a secret scanning alert. We can click on it and see what happens. So I've enabled this pretty easily in my repository. It says possibly active secret. Now the other thing you can do, it tells you how to remediate it. Now, in this case, a secret's pretty easy to figure out. Sometimes we use connection strings and how those go through. Um, I have the option here to close it. Now, the reason why this is here is because often we put things in, pa in tests that we don't want in production. So if we can qualify this as being used as a, in a test, we can go ahead and put that out. Now, you can also take away this feature from your developers so they can't just push their password through. But if we were in that github.dev file, we would absolutely <laughs> not have this feature here. So yes. So we can close the alert, we can keep it open, and it points us to where it is in the file. So it's found one secret. We can go to the password. Now we can see in this repository it picked up pretty easily. It saw my credentials, um, and it gave us that alert. 
So all these things are pretty easily turned on. If I go into my settings in my GitHub repository, and I go into my code security and analysis, and all I have to do is click the button. So how do we enable these things? We hit the button and it says enable. So I've enabled my secret scanning on this repository, and I was actually able to, to catch it. Um, so it pulled up that secret for us. It also has pull request check failure. So in the one I'm going to run, if I have a pull request, I only want high errors, so I can set that level. So when I'm pushing my pull request, when I'm setting my pull request out, I can say maybe only critical bugs, or maybe only small errors, or maybe warnings. If it's on a warning, I fail everything through. So I can set the level of these things. The other thing I've set up on my repository is CodeQL analysis. That's our code scanning, and we'll go through that in a second. So in the code I just pushed, we also have dependencies. So what do our dependencies actually look like? Actually, I messed up. This is not my broken repository. Let's go to a broken repository. I can't get to it. That's OK. Um, I don't have any dependencies broken here, but the dependent bot alert will show, pull that up and pull those across. Um, let me see if I can actually find it so I can show it to you all. Um, would you guys like to see the dependent bot alerts? Yeah? OK. Let me find out where I put that repository. Here we go. So I've embedded a lot of security alerts into this. So I have 100 security alerts. This is a good one to use. So again, picked up a couple secrets. This one's picked up an Azure storage account access key, and this one's picked up an Azure application secret. So same thing, I can look at that. So the code scanning is going to run every time I push my code up. This one has found sensitive information. So when I look at the clear text logging, and I go ahead and open this up, it goes, right, we found clear text logging. It tells me where it is, what branch it is. It tells me what security weaknesses it pulls up. And it's given it a tag of high severity. So as a developer, I know that if I see any of these, it's going to open up a pull request in my repository, and I can address that pull request right then and there. So it sees a high severity. And we can go ahead and address it. Now, again, I can dismiss this alert, but I don't want to. This could be a false positive, could be used in tests, but in this case, it's not. When it opens up this alert for me, we can see it's given me an issue. So I'm going to go straight to that issue. Because when we talk about DevOps practices, the other thing we need is full traceability end to end. Because if we're planning things, doing things, um, we need to be able to track and how to revert it. So we can see that we have an issue that's already opened. GitHub's done this for me through that. It's already labeled as a bug. It won't fix. It's assigned me to it, because I've set it as a default to assign myself. So I get a notification. I get it in my inbox. And from here, I can fix it. I can create a, a specific branch for it, fix that issue. I can assign it to a project or a milestone in my project. So I have ways to trace this full end to end. And then I also know in my code base, I have 97 vulnerabilities in here. So I also know that there's some critical vulnerabilities. There's some less critical vulner vulnerabilities. So the same thing's open. This is open this up automatically. It's given a severity score. It's going ahead and tell me how to update it. So as a developer, as I'm trying to fix my code, I can stupidly put passwords and things. I can accidentally put connection strings and things. But things like consuming open source is hard for me to identify. And really, how to remediate takes time away from what I'm doing. So by being able to create the security update, it tells me how to fix it, what version I need, and I can do it from there. Now, I can address my more severe issues if I want to. Um, and if something's less severe, I don't have to address it right away. It tells me what the impact is, tells me the workarounds, the plugins, and all of the things that I need. So this was open two days ago, critical severity. So if I go ahead and create the dependent bot security update, let's see what it does. I need like really good elevator hold music for this. Let's see what it Anyone know a good joke? Why do developers write code in the dark? Because the light attracts bugs. We'll come back and check on this, because I'm completely dependent on the Wi-Fi here. So these are all things I've pushed just up from my code base. It will stop me from pulling my code out. So when I went to deploy that uh, change in my YAML file, I'm going to pull up our. Okay. 
Okay, good, we have an error. That's what we want. So when I push that change up, we're going to go back and check on the, uh, the little dependent bot issue. So when I push that code up, what happens? Now, I went back into my GitHub, um, into my other GitHub repo to show you all the dependency stuff. But what if I can see this all from the single pane of glass? For those of you all using Notepad++, you have to context switch to the next place. So we had to leave that, go to our browser window, look at all our dependencies and fix stuff. But I want to be able to do it from the exact same place, so I don't have to context switch. So I'm going to go back into our code spaces here. And in one of my extensions, I have the GitHub Actions extension. So if I were to open up VS Code right now, I would have this exact configuration as we see it today. Um, the only difference is it's running locally on my machine. Now, the other cool thing is I can run this code space on my machine. So where I normally have to clone my code, pull my code down, I can use the code space. But actually, it's not running any code on my machine. It's just another secure development environment. The other thing I can do is I can pair program. I can ask one of you all to open up your laptop. I can create a live share session, and we can, we can rubber duck together and solve this. You can be on your VS Code. You can be on your Visual Studio. Or you can be in another GitHub code space and have that same experience across the, the board. So we did make some changes to our code. Um, and actually, I probably should initiate a pull request for what we did. It already did. That's fine. Um, you know what I didn't do is I didn't create a new branch. Come on, guys, you're supposed to tell me these things. I forgot to create a new branch. And I think actually that's why I broke my demo. So let's try it on a different branch and see what happens. So I don't have branch protection on my repository. <laughs> Um, I know, I know. I, uh, I, 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 I need the feedback. I need to fix that. I need to do better. Everybody needs to do better, right? So I'm going to go ahead and create that branch across. Um, okay. Let me make. Let me make a file change. Still didn't break it. Darn it. But we've created a pull request right from the browser. So if I go back to, well, let's come back here, little buddy. Sorry, zooming in makes it harder for me to see everything, but I know it's great for you all. Right, so I've changed this file. Uh, I can assign it to myself. I can assign it to someone else. I can see that pull request from within that code space experience. Um, I'm going to go ahead and assign myself to it. Now, when I assign it to myself, I don't have Teams open, but I get a notification in my Teams. And because I also work in Slack, because I work in both Teams and Slack for my day job, I get a notification in Slack, and I get an email notification. It's like inception hell of notifications. But then I'm communicating to myself and to my team when this project's been updated. So a really good feature of being able to hook this in, all these changes in your repository into your communication tools, whether that's Slack or Teams, is that you can notify your people when things are happening. So when you do have an outage or you are pushing a feature, they can see it. They can see the pull requests and have full visibility as well. So I can see the changes I made here. Uh, it says I have no conflicts with the base branch. But we can see that there are three pending checks. Now, this is the exact view I would get is if I were in my um, browser window. But then I also have the GitHub extension for um, actions. We should see a little guy running over here right now. It's just not green. Okay. Let's. All right. It's not running. That's okay. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up a different um, visual for you all. Because I like breaking everything on the day. So we can see all these uh, pushes that we make on our actions from our, from our side here. 
So even though I can't see the one we just pushed, I can push, push up a different one. I can see all the actions and all the tasks that are here. I have the full visibility here. I can see which working branch I'm on, what actions is affecting, and I can see the environments I'm working in and the secrets and the variables. But I'm going to go into the GitHub browser so we can have a better visibility of that, because actually it's not the best visibility unless you know what you're looking at. So this is the GitHub actions flow. So we've pushed our code. We found some vulnerabilities. Um, I'm not actually going to push this to a live website right now, but this is a previous run just because um, I always joke that like you've never had a bad day till you've had a storage bad day and you've lost all your data. Another bad day is when your AD authentication breaks and you're giving a demo in front of everyone. Um, so my AD auth broke this morning, which is really cool. Um, so I need to resolve that. And unfortunately, I'm not the person that can fix that. So I got to wait for that. So we're going to use a previously ran build. So in this build, I pushed my code up. I ran my checks. So remember I told you I was building and pushing a Docker image. Now in this example, I didn't put a password in my code because I was a good developer. And when I click on this, I can see all the things that ran through in this. I can see that I set up my job. I logged into Azure. We can see I logged into Azure Container, Container Registry. I built and pushed it. But see, I have a scan for image in my task. The reason why I scan for my images, because if my image isn't secure, I don't want to actually deploy that to Azure. So I can get my full um, reporting here in the tool. I can set up other automation from this. I can say, right, my scan failed or it passed. Notify myself or others in my team. So I've built and pushed my Docker image. Let's just pretend we're actually pushing to our website, even though we're not. Once it's been through all those things, everything has to be green. Now, as someone that was an engineer at Microsoft, we could not proceed if we had even one failed unit test. On the Azure DevOps product group, we run over 50,000 unit tests every pull request. At GitHub, we run over 13,000 uh, unit tests per pull request into our live code base. So when we're doing that, we have to have all green. If there's any failure, we have to fix it, and then we have to proceed. So same thing here. I've set mine up so that anything is, anything's any green, has to be all green. I cannot have any warnings in my container image because I don't want to deploy any kind of security vulnerability to my live production site. So once it passes all those things, we can see the next job. It deploys to our test environment. So in our summary page here, we can see that, because everyone loves a pretty little picture, we build and push our Docker image. We can see the job on the left. And then we deploy it to a test environment. So every time I push my code up, it passes all the tests. It does all the uh, code scanning. It then goes to that test environment. I spin up that test environment, and then it deploys my website out. Now, on a normal day, I'd show you our website, and we'd do some live changes to it. Not going to happen today. So we've deployed it to test. Again, I need all the green in test. Now, the other cool thing about what I'm deploying to test is that every environment is the same. So I'm going to show you a test environment, I'm going to show you a staging, and I'm going to show you production. In Azure, they're all the exact same environment. In our days of working on-prem, we'd often just like deploy to the box in the corner. Now we're going to deploy to like-for-like -like Azure container apps in Azure. So we have everything identical. So that test is identical to production, because we've often done it, right? We've done something to either staging or UAT, and it doesn't work in production, because they're different environments. So all my, entire, all my environments are the same, and each Every single environment I'm deploying to here uses the exact same tasks, so nothing is different. The other thing I've done is I put in a manual workflow into all of this. So we can see when it gets to my staging environment, I have to review tests. We talked about doing like peer reviews in our code in that manual capacity. We still need that manual capacity when we're deploying to our test environments. So I have to manually review this. I might need myself, my management team, or a designated team of people to do this. I can then pass that through, and then this will deploy to production. And we can see here, we have our little production environment down here below. And we can add in all these deployment protection rules. So while I may not have branch policies configured on this repository like I should, the good news is, is I'm not going to deploy to production without the proper checks in my workflows. So I have to have all these reviews in place in order to go through that. So we've been able to take our code from that developer experience, push it up, make some changes. Uh, prevent ourselves from putting a, I say prevent ourselves, try to prevent ourselves from putting a password up, but we did get it in the secret scanning. The other thing that happens every single time I push my code up, I run something called CodeQL. CodeQL is another security tool. If I go to the workflow file, I'm going to go through one of the runs we've had previously, pending the internet. Come on, internet, you want to work? This is going to run on every single pull request. 
So every time I push code up, so while it didn't catch it in push protection, this will run. It will pull the password. That's how I found the passwords previously, by using this code QL. The code QL analysis takes your, takes your code, treats it as data, analyzes it, um, and it sees that I have JavaScript in my file. It's going to analyze it, perform the analysis, and again, that has to be all green. So I cannot have any issues in my code before I push that up into the cloud. And I promised you all that I have a cool little, uh, little action here that closes my pull request. This is one of my favorite actions. If I go to the environment YAML file in here, anytime I do a pull request, type closed, it deletes my test environment. It deletes the Azure resource group, deletes the environment, logs into Azure, and cleans up everything. Why do I run this? Because anytime we're running in the cloud, we tend to leave things running and we have cost issues. We've all done it over a weekend. We've ran up that $10,000 bill, but we can prevent that by doing simple tasks like that in the cloud. So we've done deploy some stuff end to end. Um, you're going to see AI coming out. I'm not going to talk about it today um, as much. It's going to go through that entire developer experience. Why? We want to enable you to have a better developer experience, to be happier, and to prevent those things from going to your production environments in the cloud. So I have a bunch of resources for you all today. Uh, we have the GitHub blog. So any product announcements will be on our roadmap publicly. On the blog, we also then put a blog out about what's happening. Now, everything I did today is in the GitHub and Azure learning site. The biggest thing, you know, when I was starting off in tech, we didn't have free resources. We had books, we had paid courses. The GitHub and Azure Learning goes to the Microsoft Learn site, and it teaches you all about the GitHub and Azure integration. Uh, we also have courses on um, Azure DevOps and GitHub, and Azure DevOps and Azure, and how you can integrate the two. So there's some really good learnings there, so there's really good use cases. So thank you all for joining today. I'm going to go ahead and open up for some questions. Where's the you promised wine. You promised port. Where's the port? Yes. Um, you were talking about how you guys can support custom menus. Yeah. Yes. Uh, do you have any thoughts about waterfalls and callbacks? So the question was about um, how we at GitHub and Microsoft deploy to production every day and thoughts on rolling back and rolling forward. Yes, traceability, absolutely. So everything we do from end to end. So all the changes I've pushed today, um, I attach the SHA code in GitHub to my pull request, and then I can track that to my Azure Container Registry, et cetera. So then if I am using my good developer practices, branch protection, all that good stuff, peer reviews, I can revert my commits as well and, and roll back those changes pretty quickly. So that's one way we do it. The other way we do it is we use feature flags in our code. So when we're deploying something, we're using if statements effectively. But using the CI CD tooling to say, right, we've made a mistake, we can pull that change back and revert that change and restore state much faster than restoring from a backup or uh, et cetera. So this changes the backup story, right? Um, I've worked with customers that are still deploying stuff from the portal, and when something breaks, they're going into the portal to redeploy it and have to recover stuff, pull their backup tapes, um, pull it from their off-site storage. Um, now we're able to use infrastructure code and redeploy it and then pull the data from another source. So it changes that by using the CI CD protocols. All right. Um, I'll be around for the rest of the day. Please feel to reach out to me over LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, and enjoy the port in Porto. And thank you all for joining. <laughs>